Welcome to Tokyo Wave, recorded in a live studio in Harajuku, Japan, with your hosts, Aaron and Parker. All right, everyone, welcome to episode 51 of Tokyo Wave. We are your hosts, Aaron Randall and Parker Allen. This week, we are joined by a special guest, Benjamin Boaz, writer, translator, Cool Japan ambassador, global communications specialist, mahjong expert, and Aikido practitioner. On Tokyo Wave, we bring you weekly updates from our studio in Harajuku. Join us in segments featuring this week's top news, political happenings, business, and other random garbage. Here are this week's top news highlights. Prime Minister Suga to invite Biden to this summer's Tokyo Olympics. Popular Japanese TV news program Tokudane ends after a 23 year long run. Japan Netherlands team to help free grounded ship in Suez Canal. This week in Japan. All right, to get us started, our first story Prime Minister Suga to invite Biden to this summer's Tokyo Olympics. Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga said he will invite the U.S. President Joe Biden to this summer's rescheduled Tokyo 2021 Olympic Games. Hopefully he can get on the airplane okay. Ooh. When asked about the possibility of welcoming Biden to the Games when he travels to Washington next month for talks with the president, Suga said in a parliamentary session, Of course, I think that will be the case. Addressing questions at the Upper House's budget panel, Suga noted that the leaders from the Group of Seven Industrialized Nations have supported Japan staging the Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics as planned. Last month, the G7 leaders said in a joint statement they will back Japan's commitment to hold the Games. In a safe and secure manner this summer as a symbol of global unity, in overcoming the COVID-19 crisis. The Olympics are due to open on July 23rd, a year after the original schedule due to the spread of the virus. So the torch relay has already begun? Yes, uh, they started in Fukushima and I guess they're running around the country as we speak. Wow, wow. Is it like, is it like going on planes and coming off planes and stuff too? I think once it's here, then they don't do that. They just sort of run around the country. I'm not sure though, actually. That's a good question. They should have like a live stream of like where the torch is, you know? Yeah, because they were supposed to have these huge crowds around the country, but that was of course uh, largely scaled back due to the pandemic. I mean, the only thing that comes to mind is that I guess they really will be having the Olympics this summer now that the torch relay has started. Yeah, yeah, wow, wow. Or there's be like, hey, can you just kind of stop? You know, actually, we're going to cancel the games. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and up next, popular Japanese TV news program, Tokudane, ends after 23 year long run. Tokudane, a weekday morning news program that aired on Fuji TV, ended on March 26th. Tokudane was first broadcast on April 1st, 1999, and aired every weekday from Monday to Friday from 8 to 9.50 a.m. The anchor of the show from its start to its finish, Tomoaki Ogura, 73 years old, is perhaps now one of Japanese TV's biggest personalities. It is rumored that Fuji TV was tired of paying his salary. In addition, the previously number one ranked show had fallen behind competing morning news programs on rival networks in recent years. Prominent gaijin talento Dave Spector ran an entertainment segment on the program for the last 22 years. Spector's segment was the first to use paparazzi-style footage on Japanese TV and actually predates TMZ. You know, I watch this program somewhat religiously because it's on literally every morning. And it's really sad to see it go. Aaron, did you ever watch this TV show? I think occasionally, yeah, um, when I used to wake up a lot earlier. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, pandemic. Just to be honest. Yeah, but 
Dang, that is a crazy schedule, man. Monday to Friday, 8 a.m. every day since 1999. So apparently the people who were on the show had to wake up at 3 a.m. to get to the studio to film it because it's live. My jaw just dropped. That is some mad dedication. Wow. Yeah, no kidding, right? Yeah, we know a little bit about it uh, doing a podcast, but we're uh, we're not that... Uh, I don't know if uh, Tokyo Wave depended on us uh, waking up at 3 a.m. every day. I'm pretty sure that there would not be a Tokyo Wave anymore. Or we'd just be drunk all the time. <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> and on this next segment, ah, screw it. Let's go get some more beer. <laughs> Up next, Japan Netherlands team to help free grounded ship in Suez Canal. Kyoto News has reported that the Taiwanese operator of a massive container ship wedged in the Suez Canal said Thursday the ship's Japanese owner will send a team consisting of salvage companies from Japan and the Netherlands to help rescue the stranded vessel. Evergreen Marine Corporation, which operates the ship, aptly named the Ever Given, said it will do its best to refloat the vessel, which ran aground on March the 23rd in cooperation with authorities in Egypt. The incident with the ship owned by Shohei Kisin Kaisha LTD, a ship leasing business based in Ehime Prefecture, Western Japan, has caused a bottleneck blocking other vessels from traveling the vital trade waterway in northeastern Egypt. So if you're not familiar with the Suez Canal, it is essentially one of the, besides the Panama Canal, the busiest pathways in maritime trade. Mm. And without this canal, you basically have to navigate around the entirety of the African continent. Right, right, right. And this is, this is the major trade route that uh, Asia uses to, to trade with the rest of Europe. And the Middle East, uh, you know, um, I heard there's 900 ships now. Probably this was yesterday. Uh, as of yesterday, 900 ships are in the water waiting for this thing to like move, right? <laughs> Austin Powers style. And these typical Japanese ships, they just got to drift everywhere like it's Tokyo Drift. What's wrong with these guys? I heard that they're actually going to have to go onto the ship and take off containers of cargo, but they can't even get on the ship. There was a commentator on BBC, an economic commentator, saying that this is going to have a huge impact on global trade um, and might actually uh, drip down to e-commerce as well. If 900 ships yesterday, I'm guessing maybe 1,800 today, how are they going to refuel those ships? Aren't there pirates in this area as well? Well, no, I mean, the canal is literally goes through Egypt. So I would imagine, you know, they've got protection from piracy but i mean the biggest problem is time because in order to get people into the canal i mean the canal is not wide it's man-made mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it's not brand new so mm. if they want to get anyone to get stuff off of the ship it's going to be more precious space blocked up by things that aren't moving Right, 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 right. So really, it's this situation where this is like the definition of a clusterfuck, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think I was complaining to someone about something personal uh, uh, being out of order. And they brought up this as an example. They're like, dude, they can't even figure out how to get this shit through the canal right now. <laughs> you know, like global trade is like literally at a stop for like half the world. Can't they just give it some, like, uh, maritime Pepto-Bismol, you know, just push it out, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but this was all um, started by a sandstorm, supposedly, too. So You mean that song from the 90s? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, so I think there is some, like, maybe, you know, global warming. Somebody call Darud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what a wild situation. Um this also reminds me too of the Diamond Princess, right? We've got like a different owner, a different management company. It's stuck in another country. So I'm sure everyone's trying to figure out like who's actually responsible, who actually has to clean up this mess. So that's probably going to drag it out longer than it should be, right? Definitely. And coming up next, we have a special interview with Benjamin Boaz, writer, translator, Cool Japan ambassador, global communications specialist, Mahjong expert, and Aikido practitioner. Thank you. 
You're now listening to Tokyo Wave. Benjamin Boaz is author of two Japanese language books on Japanese culture and education and is one of the few non Japanese to publish a manga in Japan. Benjamin has worked with publishers including Kawaii Juku, Shogaku Kan, Tokyo University, and Tokyo Institute of Technology, and contributes regularly to media outlets including Netflix, the Yomiuri Shimbun, Metropolis Magazine, the Japan Times, and Time Out Tokyo. In 2015, Studio Ghibli published Benjamin's essay, Cool Japan Isn't Cool. This led the Japanese national government to name him a Cool Japan ambassador for the Cool Japan program, in which he advises the cabinet office on its outward looking cultural initiatives. He has appeared on a variety of television programs in this role, including NHK's Tokyo I 2020. And journeys in Japan. Benjamin also holds a second degree black belt and instructor certification in Yoshinkan Aikido, despite being a total geek. Today, we're going to ask him how that happened. First of all, Benjamin, thank you so much for coming back on Tokyo Wave. Great to be back on Tokyo Wave. Thanks for having me. Yes. So, um, Ben, as we were just talking about in your bio,、um, you're a black belt now, but you used to spend all day playing video games, as、uh, you wrote about in some of your books.、Um, how did this change happen?、Uh, well, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a long story.、Um, but about a decade ago,、uh, I went through a really bad breakup, kind of like existential crisis breakup, like, oh my God, what am I doing with my life? Uh, and I happened to be in a place that had a professional trapeze school in it, like a, a circus art school. So, you know, for whatever reason, you know, in, in my, you know, in, in what I thought was rational thinking at the time, being very upset, I decided that what I absolutely needed to do was spend all day doing flying trapeze. So I did the flying trapeze lessons,、uh, but I, I felt like they weren't. They weren't hard enough. So I asked the instructor, I want you to make me do a trick that's so hard and so strenuous that I'll stop thinking about my ex. And the instructor looked at me and he said, Okay, we're going to have you do the planche. And so I, I tried and failed at doing the planche and tried and failed and failed and failed and failed again. And then I did it the next day and I was finally able to do it, but I had、uh, ripped the skin off of my hands in doing so. And I guess partially because of that, and you know, partially because、uh, the instructor didn't quite know what to make of me, when I asked him for the next thing to do, he looked at me and he's like, You should try Yoshinkan Aikido. And I, I don't know why he said that. I don't know why he had experience of it, but I do distinctly remember this is what he told me. And you know, my, my little lizard brain at the time was like, Okay, I did the trapeze. Trapeze instructor told me to do Yoshinkan Aikido. Now that's, I guess, what I have to do. So, When I went back to Tokyo,、uh, the first, the first、uh, chance that I could, I picked up my phone. I called the Yoshinkan Aikido head dojo. They picked up, you know, hello, Yoshinkan Aikido dojo. And I said,、um, can I join today? And they said, yes. So then I went and I, I joined the dojo. Oh, wow. That's、uh, a little bit surprising for Japan to just instantly be accepted、uh, somewhere like that. Uh, so, this is actually something that I've, I've found really interesting about dojos in general in Japan.、Uh, Yoshinkan led me to try other things as well. And、um, despite having this reputation for being big, scary places where you can get hurt, they're surprisingly welcoming. In fact, what I found and what I eventually wound up really just loving about、uh, Shugyo Budo training culture in Japan is just how open the door is for everyone. Like, they, they will take anyone, any dojo worth its salt. Will not turn down a real challenge. And a real challenge is an absolute beginner, like, like I was、uh, back a decade ago. Is part of the reason that they just want someone else to kick around that's a newbie? It, that, that, that could be it. That could definitely be part of it. But I mean, that's part of the training too, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I want to sign up for、uh, Aikido classes. Oh, of course. Please come tomorrow. Click. <laughs>、uh, in all. <laughs> In all seriousness, of course.、Um, hey, Toro, we got some fresh meat coming tomorrow. <laughs> Another meat bag, huh? Guess I'll get my brass knuckles ready. 
in, in all like seriousness, uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, it, it, it doesn't. It doesn't actually work like that. Like in in all seriousness, a, a good dojo like the Yoshinkan Aikido Hombu Dojo prioritizes the needs of beginners really over experienced practitioners because the, the hardest thing in any martial art is actually instructing a beginner. Dealing with someone experienced is easy because they know how to protect themselves. But dealing with a beginner, you have to be very careful about anything that you do. Uh, because even even like the slightest fall could cause a beginner to hurt themselves. So that's why before you teach anyone anything in martial arts, you have to teach them how to fall first. Right, right. E- you know, all jokes aside, yeah, th- this is one really great thing about Japan and that um, when, they, when they are teaching, as you said, with beginners, they're very, very serious and very thorough. Even like when teaching Japanese language at all the Japanese language schools across Tokyo and whatnot, I found them to be um, uh, very caring in that sense. Japan is a really good country to get educated as a beginner because of, of I, I guess, a concept that's known as, as kata or form. Uh, the same lessons are generally imparted in the same way to anyone who shows up to the, to the school or, or to the dojo. Uh, which can be a, a little bit constricting because, you know, everyone's got to learn the same way. But in a sense, it's also quite quite welcoming and inclusive because the dojo is responsible for educating absolutely anyone that way. So in my dojo, there was a woman in her 80s. There was a guy who only had the use of one of his hands, or sorry, actually one of his whole arms. Uh, th- there were a number of, of black belts actually over the age of 65. And all of us participated in the same training sessions day in and day out. Like we were all equal. That, that might be one of the coolest things about uh, having like a, a real experience in a Japanese dojo, that once you go in and you kind of cross the threshold, you're not who you are in society. You're, you're just a, another belt, like you're just another uniform. Uh, and in the sense that you might <laughs> lose your individuality, uh, y- you also just gain equal status amongst everyone. Like you're not there to be you, you're there to participate in the training. It's really a nice feeling. I mean, this sounds a lot different from say, you know, Western style teaching where they tend to cater to the student, right? So what you're saying is more, um, they, you know, they have kata, the way that they teach and they don't divert from that, right? For the most part, they, they don't. Um, a, a teacher who's teaching a class in Yoshinkan Aikido and, and for the other, the other Budo and the other Shugyo experiences I've had will teach with a consistent curriculum every single time. But the way that they teach will, of course, depend on like the individual student's uh, progress, like what they're specifically doing in that moment. That, of course, is up to the teacher's discretion. They're not going to teach a black belt the same way that they teach a white belt. But at the same time, it is important that everyone in one space is all doing the same activity together. Mm. It, it contributes to this environment of, of group spirit. The, the way that it was once uh, explained to me by a teacher uh, who was actually scolding us at the time for, uh, for being too individualistic is he said that you don't, um, you don't ask for the training to be matched to your needs. You match your needs to the trainer. Ah, oh, okay, okay. Interesting. 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 Oh, you think so? Thank you. At the same time, we did. That that was very interesting to watch. So uh, you told me that you participated in this crazy class called the Sin Shusei course. And I had read about that briefly because I had heard about this book called Angry White Pajamas. And apparently this Senshu say course is basically for insane people and yourself. Oh, How did you get into that? <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't separate myself from insane people. At the time that I wanted to join the course, I, I really was having an existential crisis. For some reason in my head, I, I felt like I had to stop what I was doing and focus a year on doing something that I thought would be impossible for me. Aaron referred to me being a geek, which is true. I still am a geek. Um, but at the time, I, I decided that if I was if I was going to grow as a person, I had to do the most ungeeky thing that I could every single day uh, to prove to myself that at least I could try. And I I told myself that I wouldn't quit, but that they would probably kick me out soon enough. So I probably wouldn't need to do it that long. I mean, I was I was pretty bad. Uh 
the Sensuse course itself is uh, a year long course. It's basically like a full time contract job for a year. You show up at the dojo at 7 a.m. every day and you leave at 4 p.m. and you have to do whatever the dojo tells you. So you're, you're basically like a, a trainee like a, or a captive intern. Uh, in addition to four hours of intense training uh, every single day, you also have to clean the dojo. You have administrative duties. Uh, you have to line up every morning and every evening. Uh, sorry, and every afternoon and beg to be trained and then thank the staff for being trained. So it's all it's all quite ritualized. And it's it's very much about kind of like giving you a, a new identity. It, it's like a year-long boot camp. And uh, if you complete the course, then you get uh, a black belt, a first degree uh, Shodan certificate in Yoshinkan Aikido, uh, and you get instructor certification as well. So I wound up completing the entire course uh, and received received the first black belt that I ever got in my life. Very cool. Um, you said you couldn't do any of the techniques, right? Um, was there anything you could do right? Uh, so um, my, my cohort was about 12 people, eight of which wound up completing the course. Four people dropped out in the middle of it. Uh, the course has been running for about, I think... Mm, it's been accepting foreigners for about 30 years now, and the dropout rate is usually around 50%. So ours was a good year. But amongst the people who stuck in, I was definitely the least technically proficient. Like we all had to do the same, you know, martial arts techniques, like throws, holds, those sorts of things. And I, I couldn't do a damn thing right. So in, in the interest of, you know, trying to <laughs> contribute despite not being able to do any of the martial arts right, I decided to focus my whole energies on doing the commands right. So in addition to doing the techniques, you also have to show strong spirit while you do that. Anytime anyone asks you anything in the Ocean Kan Dojo, if you're a Senshusei, you have to say, Os! But you can't just say, Os. You can't say, Os, 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 Os. It's always, Os, Os, Os! Basically, as loud as you can, no matter what anyone else is, is asking you. It's, it's kind of like, you know, the opening scenes in Full Metal Jacket. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Uh, and there, there were other things that we had to say, too. So I, I think I mentioned in the morning we all had to line up, like, in front of the instructor's room and beg to be trained. That really sounds like some Full Metal Jacket stuff. It, it really did remind me of that. Uh, to be honest, I would watch Full Metal Jacket maybe like a couple times a month during that year, just to remind myself that someone else on earth understood what I was going through. Wow. wow. Yeah. It, it really does sound like a, like a military type experience. Um, how many, you know, other like Western foreigners have participated in this kind of training? Uh, so the, the course, the course has been nominally open to foreigners, I think for about 30 years now. So I, I would say somewhere in the low hundreds would count the, the foreign graduates of the course. And I'm proud to count myself amongst them. Wow. Yeah. Um, is there like a group? Do you guys like all know each other? There's a, there's a Facebook group that's occasionally active. And I, I've got to know some of the other gentlemen in Tokyo. Really, really interesting guys. So I hear that Yoshinkan Aikido is popular as a training mechanism for the Tokyo police. Did you get to punch any cops? Uh, that is that is absolutely correct. I did. Yoshinkan Aikido is a little bit different from mainstream Aikido that some listeners may be familiar with. Mainstream Aikido is kind of wavy and emphasizes harmony. Um, and videos of it look a little bit like a dance. Uh, Yoshinkan Aikido is fundamentally the same thing. They both derive from the same founder. But instead of emphasizing flowy movements and harmony, uh, they emphasize precision and, uh, and strength, really. Uh, so whereas Aikido, Aikikai Aikido, mainstream Aikido went mainstream, Yoshinkan Aikido has been the, one of the preferred methods of training for the Tokyo Metropolitan Police since the 1950s. And it, it used to be uh, a rule within the Metropolitan Police that anyone who was training riot cops in Tokyo had to do the course that I went through. Wow. Uh, so it used to be known as, as the riot police course. So half of my compatriots were policemen oh, and, and police women. 
Uh, and there were definitely parts in training where, since I was one of the biggest guys, I would run around trying to punch cops in the stomach. A couple of times I, I connected and they kind of keeled over. I, I felt pretty bad about that. You're supposed to dodge the punch. Gotcha. So uh, this is after you had kind of like advanced to the training and they, they used you as kind of like to, 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 to rile up everybody? <laughs> no, no, no. It, 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 yeah, it, it's a, you know, if you want to rile up cops, just throw a guy gene at him, right? <laughs> uh, it, was, it was a little bit more of a controlled environment than that. Uh, all Aikido techniques are, are techniques are reactive. It's not an aggressive martial art. It's about dissipating con conflict. So in order to set up the technique, whoever's having the technique done on them has to attack. Without an attack, there is no Aikido technique at all. So one particular day we were practicing techniques to use on a punch. So I would go around punching people so that they could do the technique on me. The person getting beaten up was me. But I was punching and punching and punching, and enough of those punches connected that um, the skin tore pretty significantly around the knuckles on my right hand, and it didn't heal for the good part of a month. And there's still tiny little scars here, my memento of the course. Wow. What happened to your hands, Ben? Yeah, I just had to punch all these cops. I mean, you know. <laughs> I, I probably did tell that to friends. I mean, it was true. And when else are you going to say it? It's a pretty badass drinking story. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. And I also appreciate the beers that you've given me for this recording session. Very nice of you guys. No problem. Uh, that, that was probably not the most interesting injury that I had, though. Uh, in Aikido, you do a lot of techniques from Seiza. So you're like walking around on your knees. And if you're walking around on your knees all day, there's a lot of friction. Uh, so we, we called them the big red suns. Like the entire skin part on top of your knee would, would peel off, revealing a large red circle mm. that you were responsible for dressing and cleaning every single day. Like if you bled in the dojo, it was considered to be your fault and a mistake. And every morning I would like wake up from my bed and kind of swing my legs off and then feel the scabs on the big red sun's crack. At the same time, every single morning, to the point where I got used to it. It's such an absurd thing to get used to that sort of like regular amount of pain. I totally sound like a crazy person now, don't I? No, it, it's wild that um, it's, it's your own fault if you bleed in the dojo. Do you get punished even more if you bleed? Yes. Um, if, uh, uh, what is it? Tra training sessions range from between 60 to 90 minutes or longer if the instructor decides just not to end the session. So if you're being pushed so hard that you need to throw up and the session isn't over, you're not allowed to leave the room. So it's expected that you will pull the uniform from its lapels up over your ears and vomit inside your own uniform. You know, there's a uh, really great quote I love from the movie Rush Hour. Maybe you're familiar Um when Chris Tucker's fighting uh, one of the, the the Hong Kong badass mafia guys, the the Hong Kong dude says, "Wipe yourself off, you're bleeding." But then when Chris Tucker finally kills him, he says, "Wipe yourself off, man, you did." Yeah, uh, I, I would say my experience lines up a little bit more with with the former part of it. Aikido is not about killing anyone. On that note, I have to ask. I have to ask because um, my sister and my brother in law are doctors, and they get incidents where people die from a single punch. And my brother-in-law was explaining to me too, you know, he, um, he used to do some martial arts and he's seen patients like this all the time. Like, wait a second, they're doctors in Bruce Lee movies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're the, <laughs> he died from a single punch. No, no, no. But like, I mean, Ben, you probably know about this, but like if you punch someone the right way in the face, like the, uh, I think it's a, a cartilage bone in your nose. It can go into your brain and it, it you'd like die instantly. Um, so my, my, my question is, how do you... Oh, how Ben's going to demonstrate it for us right now on Aaron. <laughs> no, but my question is, how do you control that? And like, where's the line? You know, when, you, when you're learning this kind of these martial arts tactics that are, you know, quite dangerous once uh, you, you have the power to actually utilize them, where's kind of the line? Um, and, and is that what described accurate is... Are these like one punch death moves like uh, a thing? Have you heard about this? I've heard about one punch death moves. We aren't taught those techniques, so I, I couldn't comment on any direct experience of them. But I mean, theoretically, sure, it's possible with enough force, 
you could probably punch someone in the, in the chest and they might die as a result. Uh, in terms of dealing with the, the relative danger level of the techniques, in the San Jose course, you're dealing with a committed cohort of people who are training together day in and day out for an entire year. So you get to know the people. Mm. And because of that, you can actually do the techniques much, much harder than you could on strangers because you're familiar with what someone can take. I mean, mm. you're dealing with someone who's, who's like your partner. Uh, so you don't want to do the technique so hard that you hurt them. I mean, the the whole point of of Aikido, the whole point of martial arts is to keep people safe. It's not to hurt them. Okay. But in figuring out just how hard you can do a technique and keep the other person safe, then you realize how to how to modulate your own strength in a useful direction. So it doesn't do any good to do the techniques half-assed or weak because then you're never aware of what your own potential is and you don't know how to control, you know, the dangerous strength that could come out of your body at, you know, one point or another. At the same time, though, if you don't know the person who you're training with, you don't immediately want to put a ton of strength into a move because you don't want to hurt them. Mm, so right, the right. answer to your question is it depends and it's all about what's happening on the mats and this is why you do martial arts training in a dojo and you can't really learn martial arts by reading a book. Well, I got to cancel that Amazon order now. Yeah, no, no, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's true. Like it's the, the, the hallmark of, of what makes martial arts training in Japan good is that it's, it's very much about the experience. Everyone wants to know about what techniques you do. And in that sense, focusing on a kata and a consistent curriculum is good because it bores people so much about the intellectual stuff that they start focusing on what is actually happening. And nothing else is important. It isn't important about specifically what technique you do. What's important is, does it work or not? And if it doesn't work, it doesn't do any good to really discuss theoretically why it isn't working. Instead, you just have to do it over and over and over again and figure it out for yourself. Even though the techniques are all the same when done by everyone, everyone's individual body is different. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, you're the only person who can ever understand what your individual body is because you're the only person who has experience with it. Makes sense. It's more of a feeling thing. It, it reminds me of music. I mean, that's the way music goes. You just have to do it over and over again until you figure out how it works for you, right? That, that's right. So my our, our head instructor had a, a very idiosyncratic way of of teaching us this specific lesson. And this this guy was amazing. He's like five foot five, but because he had such presence and such command of us, Whenever he would give a speech, he would immediately order us to sit in Seiza. So even though he was shorter than most of us, I remember him as being taller because every time I looked at him, I was kneeling. Oh, wow. wow. And he would, he would look at all of us and he would say, you know, you, you think that you're doing the techniques, but you're not. You're, you're attempting to do the techniques. You're not really doing them. So it's kind of like this yoga, you know, do or do not. There is no try thing. Mm, 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 Except mm. he wouldn't explain it like Yoda would. Instead, he would say, it's like you have two white piles, two piles of white powder. You're going to love this one, Parker. And one of the piles is sugar and one of the piles is salt. And you can look at it and you can say, this one's sugar. But is it really sugar? You can't tell. And this one's salt, but you can't tell. You know what you need to do to tell? Naminakja! Which literally means you have to lick it. He would literally say this. He would order us to lick the figurative piles of sugar and salt. And of course, the, the, the implied lesson, when the correct lesson is that you, you can't tell what something is just by observing it and being like, oh, this is what it is. You have to engage with it and, you know, place your tongue literally on the pile of salt. Uh, at the time, though, I was, I was kind of a jackass, though. And um, it, part of my daily task was to do the laundry because, you know, we had cleaning duties, you know, some of, some of us to clean the toilets, I would, I would have to do the laundry. Um, and uh, the detergent that we used for the laundry was powdered detergent. So I would take the powdered detergent to the other senshus and I would be like, what is this? This is white powder, but what is this? Can you tell me what this is? And they'll be like, Ben, that's laundry detergent. I'm like, how can you tell? You haven't licked it yet. Did you get anybody to lick it? They, 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 they probably punched me for that one. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say you ate laundry and this detergent. Was for, and this was before Tide Pods. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, the, the younger generation certainly knows a lot, a lot more than I ever could on, on this subject. But um, 
I mean, it's, it, was, it, was, it was funny, the, the way that we were taught, because um, both because of its own in institutional history and because of its affiliation with the police, it doesn't do any good to really explain the experiences at all. You just have to do them. And in, in that sense, uh, my instructor, you know, telling me to lick salt and sugar obviously wasn't literally about that, but it, it didn't even do that much good to think too much about why he put it that way, because the whole point was just to inspire me to keep on practicing. Like the hardest part of the year wasn't so much getting beaten up or like being frustrated and not being able to do the techniques right. It was having to go in every single day and like beg to be trained and beg to be yelled at despite never doing anything right. And just the, the psychological toll on that is such that it, it's actually good to not think about it at all and just to do it. So in that sense, it was, it was more useful than like the Yoda explanation of do or do not, there is no try. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's a great life lesson, uh, what you just described. I don't know if uh, I'm walking into something by asking this question, but did uh, anybody ever like snap or kind of go crazy? That's, that's a very good question. And uh, yes, that would account for some of the people who dropped out. Uh, some people even drop out on the first day. Uh, I think one guy recently dropped out. This is after I graduated because he he was joining the course, not as a beginner like me, but like as an experienced teacher. And uh, they told him that he needed to clean the toilets. And he snapped. Like he couldn't take that. Um, another guy, uh, <laughs> we went to an event someplace and they they had a bar. And we did our event and then we all kind of left. And then I saw him trail out to go towards the bar and I called after him a couple of times, but he was really intent to go to the bar. And then we never saw him again. <laughs> <laughs> like he, he just disappeared into mist. I mean, the, the, the people on this course were, were, man, they had quirks. I mean, there was one guy who, um, he was probably our most dedicated Sanchuse. And he worked, he worked a night job. So like he was in the dojo from like seven to four and then he would go to his night job until like 3 a.m. And then get on an hour long train to come to the dojo the next morning. At one, sometimes he would try to drive and throughout the course of the year, he totaled two cars. After he totaled the second one, he needed to take the train and it, his transfer route involved the Yamanote loop line that goes around Tokyo. And one day he, he didn't come to the dojo until like 4 p.m., like right before we were leaving. And we asked him what happened. He said he fell asleep on the Yamanote line for like seven cycles. <laughs> like it goes around once every hour. He got this like heavily injured, you know, like martial arts guy just like dozing off. I guess no one touched him. Wow, wow. Uh, at one point, and you know, we might have to cut this because it's too graphic, but he and another Senshuse were in, in the men's room together. And he turned to the other Senshuse and he was like, you know, it's really, really tough with blood in my urine, but I guess we all have to deal with it, huh? And the other guy wisely said nothing. I did not have to deal with that problem, thank goodness. But yeah, the guy who graduated, despite all of these troubles, he was a legend. And then there was the other guy who um, probably had less experience than me going into the dojo, decided that he really needed to make a change for himself because he had, he had formerly had, had problems with his weight. Thin guy, had clearly lost some weight because he had like, uh, what is it, stretch marks on his skin. But for whatever reason, whenever we saw him in the dojo, the only things that he would eat were ice cream and like, like donuts, like, like baked goods. Wow. For, for a whole year doing like intensive martial arts and like your, your diet changes. Like I would, I would like go home to like my apartment and like take out like a whole, you know, what is it? Like a half quart of like soy milk and just chug it all at once. Th this made sense to me at the time. You just eat and eat cause you're so tired. But in front of us, this guy who I nicknamed cookie monster would only eat like ice cream and donuts. Just imagining like one of these. What a mean nickname for an ex fat kid. I mean, I, I, I didn't say it Cookie to be mean, monster. but the guy was a monster because he was able to subsist only on cookies. I mean, he was, it was phenomenal. 
It was it was a nickname out of respect, not to make fun of his past, which no one talked about. That's a uh, Mr. Cookie Monster to you. I mean, more like Cookie Monster Sensei. I mean, he turned out to be really good, but I don't know how he survived. Cookies are very nutritious. Uh, you know, I wouldn't take that comment seriously if not for a year spent together with Cookie Monster, like observing his movements day in and day out. He only ate cookies and ice cream. You know, I'm just a... Uh... I uh, have a funny story in my head playing out that like, you know, one of these American guys trains there. He goes back to the States. He goes to the doctor. Oh, Mr. Patterson, we uh, we looked at your vitals and did a CT scan and it looks like uh, three of your rib cages have pierced uh, uh, four internal organs and uh, you, you have about 24 hours to live, sir. You're bleeding internally. We actually don't know why you're still alive. I was doing Aikido in Japan. You telling me I'm going to die now? Uh, it's definitely changed my perspective on injury and pain. I don't know how these guys made it through. Like, I, I just don't know. Yeah, some of these stories you're telling me are nuts. Um, can we talk a little bit a little bit about that? Uh, you, you mentioned that, you know, your relationship with pain changed significantly after this experience. What does the real world feel like to you? Or what, what did the real world feel like to you after this experience? Well, let, let, me, let me start by, by saying how it felt before and, and how I think many people can conceive as pain. When, when people feel pain, they, they tend to, to understand it as a signal to avoid doing the next thing. In fact, they'll, they'll instinctively stop doing what they're doing because they feel pain. And if, if I could reach you right now, Aaron, I would, I would demonstrate. Or here, I'll, I'll you know... I'm, I'm just mind throwing a pen at you and you flinched and you held your hand up in order to stop yourself from feeling, you know, the pain of, of the pen going into your eye or something like that. <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty bad. Um, I, I don't think I can throw a pen that accurately, but I thought the same thing too before I, before I did the course and before I got into this sort of stuff that like pain equals bad. But during the course, you learn to tell the distinction between pain and discomfort mm -hmm. and actual danger and injury. And they're not the same thing. Just because something is painful doesn't mean that it becomes permanent or it becomes an injury. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's several like holds or stuff in Aikido. Uh, there's a particularly painful one called Yonkajo, where you put uh, a lot of pressure on a pressure point right around someone's wrist and it, it hurts like hell. But when they stop doing the lock on you, the pain eventually goes away. Mm hmm. So it doesn't signify an injury, it only signifies discomfort. Whereas on the other hand, if you fall wrong, uh, and you know, you, you fall like directly onto your hands, or you fall directly onto your shoulder, or on your hip bone, that could lead to an actual injury, a, a, a sprain, a tear, or a broken bone, or worse. And honestly, those actually might not hurt as much. Injuries don't always hurt more than very, very painful experiences. Is there like a psychological aspect in this? Because when you say injuries actually don't hurt as much, maybe the idea of um, like having pain inflicted on you also has something to do with it? That's exactly right. And I think that's a, that's a great benefit of doing these sorts of activities to experience for yourself what, what the input going into your body and mind actually is. And ultimately, the, the lesson is that all perception, pain included, is, is just a signal and how you interpret that signal is a different process from the signal being inputted. In other words, just because something hurts doesn't mean that you automatically have to stop doing it. Maybe in most cases you would want to stop doing it, but you don't want that to be an automatic reflex because then all of a sudden you're reacting to anything painful. And that's probably not the most efficient use of your energy. You know, I have to keep pulling it into examples that I can understand, but um, guitar is actually extremely painful to learn to play. Um, you have to build up calluses on your fingertips. When I was growing up... Oh, man, that's why I couldn't do guitar. It's oh, like it murdered my fingers. And, you know, I'm a sissy, so it <laughs> didn't work. No, but this filters... A lot of people quit. Uh, growing up, you know, uh, a lot of my friends did music and stuff, and they chose not to play basic guitar because it's extremely painful. Um, and your calluses go away about after a month of not playing. So if I start playing again, I have to go through the process over and over again. Mm, right. Yeah. Um, but I'm used to, but like my brain is used to it. Like when I feel the pain, I'm like, okay, this is good. This is good. The calluses are going to get strong. Like, 
Right. That's, that's, that's a really good method to go through. And I, I think that we're talking about the same thing. The ultimate goal, though, of, of doing Aikido or perhaps doing any martial art or really any art and all, perhaps guitar included, is to kind of abstract that one level. And instead of pushing through pain in order to be able to do something specific, you push through pain for the ultimate goal of, of you could call it self-actualization, self-improvement, just pushing, pushing your own personal boundaries. Being able to tell the difference, not just between something that's painful and something that will cause you injury, but also being able to tell, hey, this pain is signifying discomfort. But what that really means is that it's an opportunity for me to grow, to like learn how to do, you know, how to get back into guitar or to learn how to fall correctly or how to learn how to do the technique right. But without actual experience, both of pushing through the pain and of repeatedly doing the practice despite not doing it so well at the beginning it's impossible to progress and it's impossible i think to even understand success the, the success that comes after pushing through like you absolutely have to experience it yourself there's no way to understand it just through words this week on tokyo wave masochism and using it as a self-help tactic <laughs> Ultimately, I mean, oh no, it's it's a good point. Ultimately, the only person who can who can tell the difference between you know training and self abuse that you're just telling yourself is training is you. I mean, there were there were friends of mine, good friends of mine, who in the course when they would hear me say crazy things like pain is just a signal, they would kind of sit me down and be like, you know, Ben, like I feel like you've joined a cult. <laughs> Maybe in a certain sense I did, but I don't know. Whenever I heard that, I would always think in my mind, I wouldn't say this, but I would think in my mind, like, aren't you discounting my own personal judgment like in these situations? Uh, I like the Oshinkan Aikido Hombu Dojo, but I wouldn't say anyone should go into any of these intensive personal, uh, per personal training experiences. It's all very, very subjective. And ultimately, if you don't trust the teacher, you shouldn't be there. So it, it becomes a very, very personal decision. You, you can't generalize it. Right, right. You know, you mentioned uh, learning to fall correctly. So this sounds like a skill that is has a lot of utility for everybody, right? Um, if it's like a reflex and anytime you fall, you're going to snap into that and fall correctly, quote unquote. Um, I'm wondering, are there other specific skills you learned in this training that maybe everybody could use? Uh, well, the the thing that does the Aikido is a human body, so anyone can use the techniques and even if they don't have obvious application in real life, I think that they do. Uh, falling is an obvious one. Um, being able to stand and move with correct posture, which Yoshinkan mm. is quite good at, makes everything in daily life easier because you don't have to expend as much power mm. to pick mm. things up, to open doors, push things out of the way, ride on the crowded Tokyo subway that sort of thing. <laughs> right, right, right. And, you know, that leads me into my next question. You know, besides personal development, have you been able to apply these skills professionally? Oh, um, so it's, it's interesting. Um, both, both in experiences with the dojo and experiences in, in other training facilities uh, in, in, in Japan, like in temples and things like that, uh, occasionally um, requests will come to me to produce cultural experiences for other people. So a few years ago, um, uh, one of the people in the dojo who I met was an academic, and she had a visiting academic coming in from America who really, really wanted to learn about a, a certain aspect of Japanese philosophy. Didn't want to just learn it from books, actually wanted to experience it in real authentic environments. So I wound up curating this like four-day experience, taking him to like the dojos and temples and it was it was really, really fulfilling work because in addition to serving as his, his interpreter, I was also kind of serving as like his coach, like continually pushing him to do things, you know, knocking on his door when it was time to wake up, that sort of thing. And I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident that without someone who was both bilingual and had extensive experience in the activities themselves, it would have been impossible to do. Uh, I had a Japanese team supporting me, but I was taking the lead with the experiment, experiential stuff. And at the end of it, I, I wound up uh, receiving something I'm very proud of, an official kansha jo, a letter of commendation from Japan Women's University, uh, which I, I still keep at my desk. It was, uh, it was a big deal for me. 
Mr. Benjamin, thank you very much for teaching our professor the traditional Japanese art of hazing. <laughs> well, it, it, when you ask for it, I'm not sure if it's hazing. Um, if someone does not ask for it and doesn't know that it's coming, uh, then that's somewhere between hazing and outright torture. Uh, it's very, very important, for example, that when I started at the dojo, I was the one who made the phone call. I was the one who asked permission to join. And I was the one who lined up every morning and every opportunity saying, please and thank you. It's not just full metal jacket-ish rhetoric. It's actually very, very important to always situate the practitioner as the one asking for the lesson. Because otherwise, you really do wind up in, in abusive territory. Gotcha, gotcha. It's got to be voluntary, right? You have to specifically be asking for it. Like the energy always has to come from the person receiving the lesson. No, 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 Mr. Policeman. He was asking for it. You know, there's probably situations like that at, at you know, certain places. I, I won't say that those don't exist. Um, the people who taught me never even came close to that sort of thing. Uh, I was never encouraged to quit, but it was always very obvious that if I wanted to quit at any time, I could. Actually, no, that isn't even true. During some of our lectures, the teachers would say, if you want to quit, you can leave. Chicken. <laughs> I mean, you know, people would think that that was implied, but the, the funny thing is, is that the, the teachers actually weren't being um, dismissive by encouraging people to quit. They didn't want them to quit. They just wanted them to only stay there if they really meant to stay there. I once helped one guy quit. He couldn't speak in, in Japanese, so I had to interpret for him. And it, it wound up in this kind of like bizarre conversation where he was asking the teachers, like, aren't you just telling me like, you know, to quit because you want me to quit. And the teacher was like, no, 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 no. This guy was, uh, we'll call him Bob. Like, no, Bob, we don't actually want you to quit. We're asking you to stay because you think it would be a good experience for you. But if you want to quit, we won't stop you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and when he did quit, the head teacher wound up shaking his hand. It was oh. really nice of him, yeah. You had asked me about, uh, what do you call, the other cultural experience work that I did. Um, more recently, and this, this, this kind of came in through a referral, one of the most interesting jobs I've, I've done in my life, a, uh, a Hollywood actor was in Japan and absolutely needed to experience intensive Japanese martial arts training. Like fa famous guy, um, because they needed someone bilingual with a specific background, uh, I wound up designing his course and I wound up actually teaching the course uh, for a number of days. Uh, which was uh, just an incredibly in, in intense and fulfilling experience because this guy was completely committed to trying as hard as he could like during, during our martial arts sessions. So because of that, uh, I and, and the team that supported me were able to give him much more than we had ever initially intending. Like we would occasionally like, ask him, like, is this too much? And he kept on being like, you know, give me more, give me more. So we, we turned up the level of intensity so that it was pretty close to the Senshuse course itself. And uh, I'll, I'll never forget it. At the very end of all of his sessions, um, he, was, uh, he was standing in one particular stance uh, for a long time. It's part of the training that you have to be very used to the stances. So he was standing in this stance for longer, significantly longer than would be comfortable. And steam started coming off of him. Whoa. I'd never seen this before in my life. Like literal steam started rising from his body. And as, as you know, as someone who was, you know, taking the position of teacher, I, I kind of had to like almost reality check myself and be like, wow, I'm humbled to be in this student's presence because I had never seen anything like this. And what could you call it except for just commitment and spirit? Wait a second. I think there's a cool martial arts quote for this. The student has become the teacher. <laughs> well, it, you, you learn more as a teacher than you do as a student. I mean, that, that much is true, but I, I, I never even thought anything like this was possible. And it's not like I gave it to him. I mean, it was in him the whole time. I, I don't mean to, to, to say anything pejorative about, you know, other professions, but it, it, it certainly wasn't what I would think of when I would think of, you know, a Hollywood actor whose, whose job it is is to pretend to be other people actually wind up being more of the real deal than I had ever seen before. It was just phenomenally impressive. Was it like some Tom Cruise level uh, intensity? Like you ask him like if he wants more and then he puts you in a chokehold. 
don't stop until I stop fucking breathing. Uh, I would say that the energy behind it was similar. He did not actually put me in a chokehold. Okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, but I this, don't think Tom Cruise yeah. has ever done that, by the way. I'm just <laughs> imagining stuff that Tom Cruise does while he's on set. Uh, you know, I, I do I do have a friend who who has done some work for the man. He said that he was very nice. Oh, yeah. yeah. He seems yeah. like a super yeah. professional. Yeah. Um, but the the this kind of like bespoke cultural experience work has been in, in, incredibly satisfying. Like there are people who come to Japan looking for really personalized and authentic experiences that you can only do here. And I, I kind of get to serve as like the bridge between them and and almost themselves. Like they come to discover this hidden aspect of themselves and I get to discover it with them. That's really cool. That's really cool. Keanu Reeves, what do you think about this? Whoa. <laughs> so, um, uh, Ben, uh, before we close up, is there any shout outs you want to give or uh, to any projects or anything you're working on right now? Well, I, I guess I'd, I'd like to thank everyone in the Yoshinkan Aikido community for making it possible for me to do this session, uh, particularly the teachers uh, past and present at Yoshinkan Aikido Hombu Dojo. If any listeners are interested in trying out Yoshinkan Aikido, that's, that's a good dojo to stop by. If uh, somebody wants to contact the Yoshinkan Aikido people, what, how do they do that? Oh, uh, so if you want to contact the dojo, they're located in Takeda no Baba, which is uh, in the west part of central central Tokyo. It's spelled Y O S H I K A N. Aikido is A I K I D O. Uh, if you Google Yoshinkan Aikido, you should be able to find their their web page, uh, and they do respond to English language emails. If you'd like to ask me um, about uh, about contacting them or, or anything about my experiences, my own website is www.benjaminboaz.com, uh, and I'm I'm always I'm always happy to talk about uh, to talk about this stuff. It's it was uh, very very Im- Im- important to me in, in in my life, so I'm I'm happy to have the chance to share it on this podcast. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Benjamin, thank you so much for once again coming on Tokyo Wave. Uh, Thanks for having me. Hey, listeners, that's right. You, you listener right there. Who do you think should be our next guest on Tokyo Wave? Let us know. Drop us a line at wave at tokyowave.jp. We hope you enjoyed Tokyo Wave. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. 